And this day, O oh God, we remember the tremendous event of 11 years ago. When was the world already turned upside down by war? Our own nation was precipitated into that fiery furnace by the attack that was made upon our ships in the Western Ocean. A war which we fought the great energies of this nation and it incomparable resources. A war which put millions of men under arms and sent millions of men across the Atlantic and across the Pacific. A war which cost us the lives of hundreds of thousands of our young men and brought Sorrow and anguish to hundreds of thousands of homes in our land. And now we find ourselves in another bitter war. We know, O oh God, that the hearts of the people everywhere, in all parts of the world, regardless of what their leaders may be or say. The hearts of the people desire peace and are anxiously waiting for the dawn of peace. We pray thy blessing upon the president-elect as he sails through the waters of the Pacific. And as he takes counsel with those who are to be his advisors in the future, we earnestly pray that some means may be devised which shall bring peace to that unhappy peninsula blood soaked today, Korea. When we think of our own battles, Wars come and go, but the truthless war is a war with evil in our own souls. Give us victory in that war to the captain of our salvation, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for everyone who has come into the church tonight from far and near. May they receive a blessing here. We pray for any who are on a long course, for those who may be cast down and discouraged or unhappy, for those who have not yet given themselves to the Prince of Life, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If our old Holy Spirit induce them to do that thing, that greatest commitment and the joy of this night, comfort any sad and troubled heart, and speak peace unto thy people, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Walk from yonder vestibule, but it is one out of the greatest of all question boxes, the Bible. Why tarriest thou? It was spoken by Ananias, a man who rescued from odium that name which had been borne by two other Ananiases. He was sent to speak to the Apostle Paul, who had been struck down at the gate of Damascus, and then for three days had been lying in darkness in the house of justice in that city. Ananias went to him and greeted him as a brother, Brother Saul. He told him 
of the great things that God had in store for him. And when he had finished that, said, Why tarry it thou? And Paul no longer tarried. For some reason, he seems to have been tarrying. He no longer tarried. He came to a decision. For that Christ whom he had persecuted and rose and was baptized. Why tarry it thou? That's always a timely question. It's a timely question for anyone who is in a wrong path or in a wrong association tonight. If you know it's wrong, why do you tarry to get out of that path? It's a question for anyone to whom God has been speaking to do a good work. Why tarry it thou? It's a question for anyone who is still halting between two opinions. Who is not yet come into the church for chosen Christ. Why tarry it thou? If you can't give a good answer, I would tarry no longer. Now let us sing the second hymn, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Ezekiel, the second chapter, and the first verse. Son of man, stand upon thy feet. When the prophet Ezekiel was thus addressed, he was prostrate on the ground. He had just seen the most overwhelming and you might say the most glorious vision recorded in the scriptures. 
the whirlwind, the amber cloud, the circling flames, the four living creatures, with the face of the ox, the lion, the eagle, and the man. And those four living creatures, each one accompanied by a great wheel, a wheel within a wheel, high and dreadful, and the rims of the wheels full of the eyes of divinity, God's eternal plan and purpose. Wherever the living creatures went, those wheels ran with them. Above the living creatures and the wheels was the firmament like unto barrel, and above all the great throne upon which one sat, the throne like to a sapphire stone, and girt about with a glorious rainbow. When Ezekiel saw that overwhelming spectacle, he fell upon his face on the ground. But a voice, the voice of God, spake to him and said, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. God had a message that Ezekiel was to give to the people. And Ezekiel could hardly receive that message when he was lying prostrate on the ground. And certainly he could not deliver it to the people in that position. It was a message to Israel, then apostate and in captivity. And God told him that whether the people heard or whether they would not hear, they would know that there had been a prophet in their midst. This is an experience which was repeated before and after Ezekiel by other servants of God. When Joshua lay on the ground prostrate after the defeat of his army at Ai, God said to him, Why liest thou flat upon the ground? Arise and sanctify the people. As you heard tonight in the chapter read, when Daniel received his great vision of the future, he was there prostrate on the ground. And a voice said to him, O Daniel, greatly beloved, stand up upon thy feet and hear the words that I will speak unto thee. Paul was prostrate on the ground after that light flashed and he heard the voice of Jesus. But Jesus said to him, Arise and go into the city and thou shalt hear what I want thee to do. When John on the Isle of Patmos saw Jesus standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, holding the seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword flaming out of his mouth, he too fell prostrate. But Christ said to him, Fear not, and lifted him up, and gave him his great mission. Reverence and humility are necessary qualifications for him who would speak to his fellow men in behalf of God. But together with that, a knowledge of the worth of man, the worth of the soul, the dignity of man, self-respect in the highest sense, those two, reverence and self-respect, go together. The very fact that God speaks to man through man lets you know what is in man 
and what man can do. There are three reasons for the greatness of man. First of all, the great way in which he was created in the image of God. And second, the price that was paid for his redemption on the cross. And third, what the gospel, what Christianity tells man that he can do and that he can be. So let us think about this. Everyone wants to count. And everyone can count. Stand upon thy feet. First of all, the great capacity that there is in man, every man. God did not have time to create a nobody. Christ did not die upon the cross for a nobody. He died upon the cross for the redemption of your immortal soul. A soul so valuable and great, Christ said, that if he were to put here on this side all the world and all its glories and splendors, past, present, and to come, and your soul on this side, all this glory of the world would be nothing, and the soul would be everything. The parable of the talent teaches the responsibility and the accountability of each one of us for what God has given us unto God. It also says that there are differences in talents. In the parable, one man was given five talents, another man two, and another man one. Each one was to do what he could with that money and increase it against the day of his Lord's return. But the parable also teaches that every man has some talent because an amount of money was given unto each one of them. You hear the phrase now and then, you've used it yourself, no doubt, how this or that person rose to the occasion, how some crisis brought out strength and nobility in that soul. It may have been an older sister or an older brother in a family when the parents had been taken who took the part of leader of that household. It may have been some heroic mother after the husband, the breadwinner, was taken and she became the head of the family and with noble loyalty and self-sacrifice brought those children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. How often I've seen those circumstances just described in my years in the ministry. I remember tonight a young woman, an attractive young woman, in the town where I began my ministry. People thought of her as just a society butterfly. But a good many years afterwards, when I went back to that city and inquired after her, they told me that she had married a young man whom I had known, a broker in New York. But he was now and had been for some years a helpless, bedridden invalid. And yet this girl, whom they thought so light-minded, just a society butterfly, had risen splendidly to the occasion and was doing a magnificent ministry to that sick husband in that home. It's in a furnace of adversity that the unsuspected uh, quality of strength may appear. I like to pause over that phrase in the 103rd Psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. 
all that is within me. Who can measure that? All that is within every person in the church tonight. Sometimes you go to hear a great choir. They have 500, 1,000 voices in it. And it thrills you and lifts you up with its music. But you may have reflected that if any one of that choir came to the front of the platform and sang by himself or herself, it would be an unimpressive performance because there was no great voice there but hundreds of voices just like that produce the great music of the creation to which you have listened tonight or the great music of the Messiah and so every one of you can add some note to the triumphant chorus of this life Anyone who has gone to Stokpoji and mused there in that venerable churchyard where the elegy was written will recall, I'm sure, the beautiful lines of Thomas Gray. Perhaps in this neglected spot he laid some heart once pregnant with celestial fire hands that the rod of empire might have swayed or wake to ecstasy the living liar. Some time ago in the historical library of one of the western universities I went into the art gallery and there was an interesting exhibit there. But all the artists were amateurs not a professional among them. And instead of the hideous daubings that we hear the critics talk about today in some of the exhibits of professional artists, you saw that they had painted the thing just as they saw it. The farm scenes, most of the artists were farmers, the inscription said, and they painted the hills about their farm, the river flowing towards the Mississippi, the fields green with the winter wheat in the autumn, or golden at the harvest time, the life just as they saw it, amateurs. And yet it showed that they had the soul of a poet and the soul of an artist in them. It seems to me that one of the most impressive arguments, if you need arguments, for the immortality of the soul is the fact of so much uninvested and unemployed talent in men. Unemployed here, but certainly to be evoked and put to use yonder. I was going through one of the books of the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard lately and came upon this sentence. He said, whenever I read the New Testament, I am impressed with the fact that every man is a giant. Now, I think he did not mean that he was impressed with the characters of those supermen of the New Testament, Peter and James and John and Paul, but that he was moved and impressed with what the New Testament calls upon men to be. As St. Paul put it, that we are called to honor, glory, immortality, and eternal life. A generation ago, a very popular novelist was Ralph Connor, known as the Sky Pirate. I think his real name was Watson. He was a major in the First World War. 
And after two years' experience in the war with the Canadian Army, he said he had made the discovery that the phrase, the common man, has no significance, that there is no common man. He said he had seen these men in the trenches and on the battle line, and he had discovered that they were heroes through and through. At home, they might be half asleep. The flint not yet struck in them. And yet, when the crisis came, when the hour to show what was in them came, they showed it and went forth to greet death as a bride. Yes, there's no common man. In the second place, let us see how the knowledge and appreciation of what is in man, of what is in you, is a secret and qualification for success in life. And the lack of that confidence, a secret of poor service or failure in life. If you think you don't count, if you think you can't count, then certainly you won't count. But you can count. And God wants you to count. The lack of that confidence is the secret of failure in many a field other than the battlefield of life. During the Civil War, Admiral Farragut ordered Admiral DuPont to take his squadron into Charleston Harbor and reduce the fort there. He made the attempt and failed. And when Farragut interrogated him as to the reason, he gave several reasons. The swift tide, the shore battery, the floating mines, and so on. When he was through, Farragut looked at him and said, Admiral, you have left out the chief reason for your failure. You did not succeed in taking your squadron in and reducing those forts because you did not believe that you could. On the other side, when Fort Duquesne was occupied here by the French and the terrible disaster befell the British and colonial armies on the banks of the Longahela and similar disasters in these colonies and in Canada, in the great duel between France and England for dominion on this continent, when Pitt came to power, one of the generals whom he sent to this side was Wolfe. But when Wolfe appeared before the cabinet in London, and they asked him what he could do and proposed to do, he drew his sword and laid it on the cabinet table and then strode up and down in a haughty manner and told them what he thought he could do and would do. Well, some of them were displeased and said, we don't want a general like that. But they sent him, and you know what he did on the plains of Abraham at Quebec in that decisive victory. By the very fact of divine revelation, commencing, say, with Abraham, and then with Moses, down to these last days in which God speaks unto us by his Son. That very fact declares the capacity and the greatness of man. The very fact that Christ died on the cross for you. The price that was paid for your redemption and what a price it was shows 
that you are of great value unto God. And yet it's true, is it not, that many people go through life and never discover really what is in them. There was a prince, a king once, who had a prince with son. He wanted him brought up remote from the corruptions and temptations of the court. To achieve that, while he was still a very young child, an infant, he gave him over into the keeping of his forester. And there in the depths of the forest, in that humble cottage, the child was brought up just as if he were one of the forester's children. And he knew no difference until he had almost reached his majority. Then he learned that he was the son of a king. A lot of people get far along in life before they discover that they are the son of a king, a child of God. Samuel said to Saul, for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for thee? In the last place, let us see how it is that Christ evokes what is in man. I'm not facing tonight any bootstrap Christianity. Mere human self-help or the paganism of Henley that you're the captain of your soul. What I'm trying to bring out is that in company with Christ the great things that are in you can be evoked. Christ dismisses the littleness of human nature and brings out its nobility and its greatness. Think of Moses hesitating, stammering, afraid to go and speak to the king of Egypt and yet see what God did with him in the end. Think of those humble Christians and what the apostles did with them. Most of them very humble people, for there's not many noble or great or rich among them, slaves, artisans. A lot of them fought as the victims of past sins and transgressions. Yet see what the gospel did with them and for them. Called to be saints, and with the help of Christ, they became saints. Think of what Christ did for Peter. When Peter was first brought to him, he said, Thy name is Simon, thou shalt be called Peter the Rock. And then at the end of their association on earth, how cowardly, how weak, how shameful Peter was, anything but a rock. But when you turn the pages into the book of the Acts of the Apostles, there is Peter, the splendid, fearless, courageous apostle, the leader of the church. Think of what Christ showed he could do for a man in his own great parable. There was that son who had gone into the far country, and in his want and rag and filth, he came to himself. Under the Spirit of God, he discovered what was in him, and realized that there was something better for him to do than to feed swine. And so in his repentance he said, I will arise and go to my father. And he did. Think of what Jesus did with those twelve apostles. Ignorant and unlearned men, as the Jewish leaders called them, in trying to account for their extraordinary eloquence and accomplishments. With the exception of Judas, he sinned against the light as all can do. They all seemed to have achieved an honorable place and did a great work for Christ in the world and became worthy of that magnificent praise of the tedium, the glorious company 
of the apostles. Napoleon III certainly was, as we measure them, not a great man. But it was said of him that uh, despite that fact, he had a way of making those who came into his presence feel uncomfortable and uneasy and, in a sense, inferior. Now, with his great uncle, the great conqueror, it was just the reverse. The hand clasp of Napoleon for one of his soldiers was like an electric shock. It was Napoleon, you know, who said that every one of his grenadiers carried the baton of a marshal in his knapsack. Now, if that was true of an earthly captain and conqueror, then what about the captain of your salvation? and what you can do in him and through him. Stand upon thy feet. Never think meanly of yourself. You will have to pass through trials and temptations. But with the help of Christ, you have strength to meet those trials and temptations. Remember what he said. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Remember that you count with God, that God loves you, that your name is graven, as he says, upon the palms of his hands. Remember that you count with Christ, count so much that he gave his life for you on the cross. Have you given your life unto him? On that house yonder on the hill on the south side, where Pittsburgh's great uh, astronomer and telescope maker, John Brashear, did his early and notable work, there above the murks and smoke of the river and the railroad yards and the steam mills. There in that house were cut his favorite quotation. It was this. Somewhere in the world there is waiting for you a work that no one but you can do. Never rest until you find it. You count. Stand upon thy feet. Bless, O God, the proclamation of thy word. Let us have no doubt that in Christ we can do all things that thou desirest of it. If this sermon tonight, O oh Lord, has stirred anyone to make more earnest and kindly use of what is in them, then may that impulse not be permitted to die away, but may they act upon it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you again all to come into the after service, sing the hymns and salute one another and hear the orchestra. God that made this earth and heaven. <laughs>